I'm Jocelyn Williamson, one of the directors of the Central Florida Free Thought Community. Thanks for joining us again here today for what has become a bi-weekly webinar and YouTube stream where we invite the most amazing people we know to share what's going on in their world. Today, we have none other than Hemet Mehta, the friendly atheist, who will just be in conversation with us today. No PowerPoint, no presentation, just a casual chat answering questions by you or me in the next uh, hour or so. We are live on Zoom and live streaming on YouTube. In just a minute, I will introduce Hemet, but I wanna be sure you know a couple of things before we get started. We look forward to being back in person again, but until then, we're going to be continuing online events, just like this one, as well as less formal Zoom meetups where we can all join in the live discussion. To find out about those in advance and to get the login information for those and these webinars, go to our meetup group at meetup.com slash CFL Freethought. For those of you in the Zoom webinar right now, you can find the chat option available at the bottom of the screen of your computer. You may need to move your mouse for that to pop up. If you're on a mobile device, just tap the screen and it should appear as an option. The chat is not where you want to ask questions. Uh, if you want to submit a question for consideration, type that into the Q&A feature, which is also at the bottom of your screen, and we'll take those questions as we're able to. And I apologize in advance if yours does not get asked. We have a limited amount of time and a lot of questions already you know, piled up, so please uh, accept our apologies if I don't ask your question. With that in mind, I will introduce our guest for today's event. Hemet Mehta is a writer, editor, podcaster, YouTuber, former math teacher, and atheist activist. He runs the very popular Friendly Atheist site, which I visit daily, if not multiple times a day. He edited the 2017 book entitled Queer Disbelief, Why LGBTQ Equality is an Atheist Issue. He wrote the Young Atheist Survival Guide, and in a slightly devilish transaction, he sold his soul on eBay, got some national attention, including being on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and also wrote a very funny book about it. Hemet was previously the chair of the Secular Student Alliance Board of Directors. He's worked with the Center for Inquiry and the Secular Coalition for America. He's been on CNN and Fox News. In 2019, he produced a limited series podcast called The Supreme Court versus Church State Separation, the first season of which was all about the complicated history of the Pledge of Allegiance, which I strongly recommend. Welcome, Hemet. Hello. Hey. Let's see if I can get this started. Hi, uh, hey. Jocelyn. It's good to uh, hear your voice as well. And thank you to everyone who's joining in. Hi. Hey. Hi, it's so wonderful to have you here. Um, how's I, I'm going to start with some very pedantic questions, such as yeah. how are you doing in this time of, of pandemic? Uh, look, I have everything. I would love to just complain for like an hour, but honestly, everyone it, in my house is healthy. We're doing okay. So I feel like, you know, everything else I can complain about, we're all complaining about. I could use a haircut. Like, it's <laughs> yeah, it's well, all good otherwise. My, 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 you know my, what my I mean? roots are changing. Yes. <laughs> That's okay, so we're though. We're doing fine. We're doing fine. Well, that's wonderful. Good. I'm glad. Um, I, I have I have some fun questions because I've been thinking about one of the things I noticed was that you on your Twitter account described yourself as a cruciverbalist. Yes. Do you do crossword daily? So I do them daily. Um, the New York Times crossword app is the one like I'll do theirs before I go to bed at night and they have their mini crosswords. So there's a bunch of people that I have no idea who they are anymore. Like it, it keeps your running time. How long did it take you to complete like the 30 second puzzle? Oh, wow. And so okay. like, it's a daily competition between a bunch of strangers, which is awesome. And uh, so far they've accepted one of my puzzles, which was published in February. Um, I've submitted a couple more. I'm still waiting to hear back on those, but there's a lot of uh, like, you can work on it and they will write back and say, these don't work for us try resubmitting and it's a oh. long turnaround time. So who knows? I had no idea. So do yeah. you do other types of puzzles or is it just, just the crossword? That is the main thing that I enjoy, like in terms of puzzling. There are some other puzzles, but uh, in, you know, when there's other kids and other things to do, it's like, that's the one I can do before I go to sleep at night and I know it'll get done. <laughs> is it um, a family thing or just you? No, just me. <laughs> just you. All right. Yeah. You competing against the other New York Times subscribers. Well, All right. yeah, for the mini crossword, for sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, all right. You wrote the Young Atheist Survival Guide. Um, I'll speak for myself. I'm no longer that young. <laughs> so do you have a guidebook coming out for us folks in the middle age? Oh, that's a good question. I feel like the website itself where I'm writing about current events, in a sense, that is kind of action items for people who are our age, older, whatever, where it's like, no, this is what's happening in the world. These are the problems we are all facing. Here's stuff we could do about it, or at least here's what you should be thinking about. Um, that's not necessarily geared toward younger people who have their own specific set of problems that they might come across if they're atheists. Right. So I feel like what I do every day is <laughs> geared toward is, is, is for the middle. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and I guess by the time you get to the end of life, maybe you should have handled it by then, but, but <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. So you've been doing this for a while. I was, yeah. I was, you know, reading up and trying to think about this and I, have you seen a change in relation to atheism in the past 20 years in the U S like, do you feel like there's actually been a change? Because you've been an activist for like 20 years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the biggest change for me in terms of atheist activism is that I honestly feel, and I don't know if this is just me or if you've felt this way too, I don't care as much anymore about trying to convince people to be atheists and making the arguments that you might have read in like The God Delusion or whatever books like that, where it's like, here's why you should not believe in God. Um, like... Yeah, I agree. But at the same time, I feel like the biggest pressing issues of our time, I feel like I have more kinship with religious people who share my values on other things. And right. so I'd rather work toward changing that stuff than, try, than, than arguing over the God stuff. So actually the stuff I write about every day has very little to do with, um, I don't know, I guess atheist apologetics so much as here is something that religion influenced. Here's why it's a problem. But to be honest, progressive Christians, a lot of people who may believe in God, I think they could read just about everything that it goes up on my site. And they would be like, yeah, I agree with you. Maybe mm -hmm. not on the atheism thing, but everything else. So I feel like a lot of, I, I know because I've been to your group in person, <laughs> you guys focus on community and building that community and actually doing things, which, which is very much not about, let's just convince you not to believe in God and we're done, problem solved. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I see more groups, I see more activism geared toward, okay, we are atheists. You don't need to convince us that material's out there for anyone who wants to find it. Where do we go from here? And I like the fact that that's kind of where all the activism seems to be heading. Because again, um, if when I started doing anything like 20 years ago, the resources were not everywhere. And now I feel like anyone who genuinely wants to look for why should I not believe in God? How do you uh, respond to Pascal's wager? <laughs> That's fine. But those resources are out there for anyone who wants to get them. And there are always, to be clear, like if you go to YouTube, you will find new people presenting that information in new ways. And that's awesome. But in terms of like organized groups and things like that, I feel it's, what do we do from here? Because we're all atheists. We're good. Now what? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, but I, I came from it as I was a, a lifelong atheist. So I, 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 I I guess I've observed that people that are coming out, if you know the, I guess I'd say that the newbies yeah. are still are still having that desire to have more of that conversation that that I think you were having 20 years ago. That's Whereas true. now I, you know, even me in the past 10 years, as I've gone from, you know, yes, I'm I'm talking about it to well, what are we doing for our community and and how do I identify as a humanist as opposed to just focusing on the atheism as a word right. being used? Yeah. And there are more like forums and places. If you're looking because you're coming out of religion and you're trying to navigate that transition period, like I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised by how many resources there are, whether it's anonymously asking questions to a group of people on like Reddit or going to an online chat. Uh, what's the uh, uh, R for R? Um, oh, recovering from religion. Yeah, religion. who has a chat room and a phone line where you can call if you have questions and you just want to talk to a human about this stuff because you don't know anyone else in your circle who can right. talk about that. Like, that's awesome. I wish some of that stuff was around when I was doing that myself. Um, 
that's what I like. Like those resources are there. The books are there. If you like that, if you prefer videos, there are people making really interesting videos. Um, that is awesome. So like, I feel like the need for like the Secular Student Alliance, which I work closely with there, I think when I started working with them, there really was this push for how do we try to get more college students to look at atheism, to consider it. Whereas now it is, uh, from my perspective, and I'm not part of it right now, it's how do you build up those communities on a college campus? Right. How do you make it relevant for them to yeah. identify and spend their time doing that as opposed to going and joining the, I don't know, the water polo team or whatever. Right, exactly. <laughs> and again, these are all questions all of us find important and interesting enough that we dedicate so much of our activism and our lives to, to talking about it and dealing with it. But we are in a spot where we want to be in the sense that, okay, we have those places to talk about this. Now, how do we harness that energy and do something positive with it, whether it's political or uh, some cause related issue? And it, it is interesting because now you're seeing splits in terms of, well, we're not all politically on the same page. So what happens when those splits happen? Because it's not just about atheism anymore. It's about how do you implement humanism in different ways? And those are different conversations. Yeah, it is. I, I know for myself, that's really been important. It, it took me a while to get there because I was like, oh, I thought we were all kind of <laughs> coming from this from the same perspective. And then I, I guess I, I will be open in my in my liberal perspective. I suddenly yeah. realized there's a whole conservative or what I identify as conservative segment um, they may have a different identifier. Right. Uh, so it's interesting I, to see that stuff kind of play out because that is, that's not a conversation I think we would have even been thinking about, you know, way back when. That's true. So that, it's interesting to watch that play out. I suspect we're going to see a lot more of that sort of thing, like in coming years. All right. Well, I, speaking of YouTube, I've noticed that you have a relatively new YouTube channel. Yeah. And, and I wanted to talk to you and ask you about that. So you've made the change. You have a lot of content and a lot of followers on your old site. You've moved yeah. over. How are you finding that? Why did you do it? Thoughts? Simple, the simple answer is this. Uh, so Atheist Voice is a channel I used to do. Um, the simple reason I kind of switched is I was doing that with a partner for like five, six years. And it was there's a lag time in terms of I want to respond to something, but I'm sending video to, to him and right. then he gets it up. No contention or anything. It's just slower. Um, and also it, because I, and also I was like in the process of moving for a lot of that and I had newborn babies and all that stuff. And now I'm much more stable in all of that. So it's like, <laughs> you know what? I kind of want to do it on my own. I also want to learn how to make the videos on my own. Cause like I'm, I, what am I, 37 or something? It's like, oh crap, I forgot how to do all this stuff that would have come so naturally to me when I was younger. So even putting together the videos and learning how to edit them and make them, that's new to me. That's something I want to know how to do. So I figured, let me just end that channel that I've been part of for so long. Let me try a new one, which is uh, just if you search for Friendly Atheist on YouTube, you'll find it. But let me do everything by myself. Um, so it's it's kind of um, me playing around with content and, you know, do I want to do atheism 101 or is it more fun to play around and read the Bible and talk about it or something else? And I haven't figured that out exactly. So I'm trying a little bit of everything, but it's been fun to kind of play around with all that. That's awesome. Learning yeah. new stuff is, is it, it can reinvigorate you to work on something as you're totally. having to learn the technology. And, and because my background in activism has been with either community groups or blogging, watching what other YouTubers are doing to make their stuff interesting and relevant and how they create content has been just a cool learning experience on my end. So um, it's kind of opened up like, oh, that's how a lot of young people are accessing atheism for the first time. Because um, for me, it w the books weren't even out when I was uh, becoming an atheist. <laughs> so, so it wasn't any of the Dawkins or anything stuff. It was online random websites written by people who clearly lived in a basement somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, that's yeah. how I came into it. And when I was in college and beyond, everyone seemed to be coming into atheism because they read a book by the new atheist. And I feel like every time I talk to a college, they only came to that perspective from YouTube more That's than right. blogs or anything. So it's been 
interesting to kind of see what all these other new people are doing. And it's really interesting. Have you thought about TikTok? I don't dance and I feel like everyone there dances. So <laughs> Actually, I I, I've, <laughs> I I will be honest and say I've recently gone into TikTok and I'm finding that it isn't just dance. There's actually yeah. a lot of commentary going on. Okay. So um, yeah, it's it's been kind of interesting. And then I started searching for atheism to see what was happening with that, yeah. which has been kind of interesting. Uh, so it's, yeah, you would I definitely hit a well younger- explore that. Yeah. Or I'll just wait for my four-year-old to turn like seven and then ask her what all the uh, yeah. Well, she'll kids start making doing. videos before you even realize that she's doing it. <laughs> I know yeah, it. yeah. I, so you you have a recent video entitled "As Atheists Get Older, They're Not Getting Much More Conservative." Uh -huh. Staying liberal sounds good, but you mentioned that we nuns are not voting. So yeah. that was one of the things you talked about in the video. So my yeah. question to you is, what do you think we can do? How are we going to deal with this? I guess, pandemic, which is right. impacting people's comfortableness to go out and vote anyway. Um, and you also suggested that Republicans will have to evolve to survive in the long run. So yeah. I, that, that, that was an undertone I picked up on. So do you think Republicans are going to actually disappear in 30 years? So it depends. There's a bunch of questions in there. I know. The, re <laughs> the Republican question, like, I mean, this is this isn't even a political statement, I don't think. It's their base is older and Christian, like predominantly that, not everybody, but predominantly that. And obviously you don't want, no political party wants a base that is primarily older because what happens 20 years from now, you got to attract a younger crowd and they're not, they're not doing it very well. Like the issues young people tend to care about, the Republican party as a whole, typically doesn't. So they're going to have, if they want to survive as a political party, they got to do more things that are appealing to younger people. I don't see that happening. But also on the religious side of things, like if you're a conservative Christian, there's a party that is catering to you. But the flip side of that is you would, I mean, I know the accusation is Democrats are like a godless party, which is silly because they don't reach out to the godless. They're, they are not godless openly or anything like that. Yeah, I, I didn't not, think so, no. <laughs> yeah, it's not like they're making a pitch to us, but in terms of issues that we tend to care about, they tend to pursue. But the question is like, if the older generation, because they're older, is going to leave at some point, and Christianity as a force, as a religion, seems to be getting smaller and smaller every year, which religious group is on the rise? It's people without organized religion. And by and large, that group of people is voting for Democrats. So, I mean, if you're a Republican, I would think you have to look to the future and say, well, how do we appeal to that group of people? Because that's where the votes are going to be. They're going to have to do that. I just don't see them tangibly making any I, I can't imagine that they don't have a master plan in the works. They, I remember they, after they... 2012, correct me if I'm wrong there, if you remember this, like after Mitt Romney lost, they said we were, our party was such a turnoff to immigrants and people who care about immigrants. We have to fix how our party stands for that. Obviously they went in a completely opposite direction by 2016. Um, but that's the sort of thing, like you have to, do this post-mortem on yourself and say, okay, we're alienating people we need in the future. Yeah, they got to do something. If Well, it, it, I mean, that, that, the, to me, that, that gives me great hope to hear this. <laughs> but at the same time, I also am not convinced that this year is going to go the way I want in November. So, so let's go back to the original question, yeah. which is, we nuns aren't voting apparently. Right. And, and where did you get that information? Can you talk a little bit about that and, and I expand? So that one in particular, I don't remember if it was the Pew Research Center or PRRI, but survey, I mean, the people who do exit polling, they will ask people after they're leaving from the voting booth, like, okay, tell us some demographic information about yourself. And it basically, uh, don't quote me on the numbers here, but if like 25% of the country is Christian of some sort, uh, that's small, evangelical Christian, I should say, but like they're 30 percent of the voters like they punch above their weight relative to their population right. but non-religious people we're also like a quarter of the population but only like 15 percent of the voting percentage so this is what i like various groups have 
done these surveys and that's what they all seem to come to the conclusion. So how do we get more of us to vote? For me, I think part of it is hard because there isn't something binding together atheists and agnostics and people who just are apathetic toward religion. We are not the same group. They just kind of lump us together. But I think this is something that I've written about that I've made videos about. Like, if you are a politician, if you're the Democrats, like, and you know people like me are probably not gonna vote for Republicans because their values go against my values. What are you doing to reach out? Because I might vote for you anyway, but there's a lot of people on the sidelines who are like, well, what are you, what are you doing for me? And there are some issues where I think you're gonna have less contention among us and you might excite us. And they never talk about that. Simple things, church state separation in general. Like we're not gonna let one religion kind of take over the government. Um, we're going to care about uh, trying to help uh, as many people as possible in the country instead of relegating them to the sidelines, instead of letting them suffer. Um, promoting science education, uh, stronger public schools. I mean, those are liberal issues in general, but I think when you ask a lot of non-religious people, what issues do you care about? Those are some of the ones specifically that I think would excite us more than just standard democratic issues. I mean, Republicans are really good at knowing exactly what it takes to get conservative Christians out to vote. They talk about abortion. They talk about the Supreme Court. They'll bring up the culture war issues. And that excites their base to go out and vote. I don't know what would, would uniformly excite nuns, a state yeah, church I, separation. I mean, I, if it's a big issue to them, but right. I, I know a fair number of people who identify as, eh, eh. I don't really care, but I'm, I'm kind of apathetic to the even having the conversation. I have bigger problems. And this is where it gets harder because like, yeah, what is the one thing, whether it's who's going to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Um, what do you care about uh, education and uh, those issues, fighting corruption, trying to make a better society? Like there's I don't think there is any one or two major issues that unite all of us. But what I'm seeing that's frustrating is they don't touch on like any of them other than a cursory mention here or there. They certainly don't reach out to atheists specifically and say, listen, we want your vote. We need you organizing your communities to get out the vote for our candidate. Like they don't do that at all. Meanwhile, Republican candidates are like going to churches and saying, no, I need you come vote for me. There yeah. isn't that outreach. I mean, granted, we are not as large. It's as it's 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 people. hard to go and find a singular spot to find us. Right. So touch uh, on a bunch of things. You know what I mean? Because right. if you focus on a variety of issues instead of standard boilerplate democratic issues, you're going to reach people who might not otherwise care. Um, and I don't see that spread of issues that they are all talking about. Um, like, again, watching Joe Biden in interviews, he kind of touches on the same few points here and there. Yeah, yeah and I, I have to say that I have several atheist, not, you know, nuns, friends on, on Facebook, and they're saying they're not going to vote for Biden. And I'm, I'm personally finding that rather shocking. Um, uh, and what I would say to those people, because I've heard that too, and it bothers me too, and it has not even to do with the, the sexual allegation case, which is, you're not voting for one person. Exactly. Like if you don't like him, vote for the Supreme Court because someone's going to replace older justices. And you can vote do a for, mic drop right there. Yeah. Supreme Court. Um, for, uh, <laughs> every Pick a department, putting competent people in terms of funding the National Institutes of Health or you EPA. Know, EPA. Education. Uh, yes. I mean, who do you want in those positions? Who do you want appointing, nominating people in those positions? Because there are like, I, I don't have a number off the top of my head. It's not about one person at the top. It's about the thousands of people that they get to put in charge of a gazillion other things. That's what you're voting for. And when people say, well, I don't like Biden for whatever reason, I mean, they're not for Trump. They're just like, no, he doesn't do it for me. I don't want to vote for him. I'm just running in my head. Like, here's a long list of who you're throwing under the bus, you know, immigrants, poor people, minorities, people of color, any, pick your group that you are basically saying, I don't care about any of you because it's not perfect. And I've heard this from someone else. I'm going to totally steal it from them. There are no perfect candidates because you're not running for office. 
So <laughs> you, yeah, you got to deal with voting for people you don't love. And again, conservative Christians are very, very good at voting for people they don't love because they seem to understand it's everything else you're voting for and we want everything else. They're still saying that today. Like we like the anti-abortion judges. So whatever, if Trump does whatever, we'll, we don't care. Wow. Well, I, I know that uh, there's a new group that started Secular Strategies um, and I, they're, they're working to mobilize uh, secular voters, empower policymakers. I'm looking at their write-up yeah. lawmakers, change makers to be effective champions of secularism in America. What um, I've found really interesting, that group, there are like two or three consulting groups that I've seen pop up in the past year or two where, yes, they are doing all those things, uh, organizing voters. They're also helping politicians, anyone who's running for office who wants to know how do you reach out to non-religious voters, which is awesome and fantastic. I hope more people are taking advantage to that of that. Um, and one thing I'm really uh, going to be following in this coming year is in 2018, after the midterm elections, I believe there were roughly 50 openly non-religious candidates at the state level or above uh, who won their races, like 50, which is mind boggling. Most of those people are either incumbents running for office again, or they're not up for election again, which suggests to me, there's gonna be a lot more openly non-religious candidates on the ballot coming up. And I, I'm kind of curious if their opponents are gonna try to use that against them. Because I feel like in some parts of the country saying, no, I'm not really religious and no one cares. It's like, yeah, that's fine. But what are you going to do for me? That's the right. question voters should be asking. So I'm very curious how much higher that number is going to go. Um, but it is interesting to watch atheist groups and organizers kind of really get into politics and saying, we know how to reach our people. We know what you can do. If you are looking for voters in our community, let us help you. Well, I, I know that um, as a 501c3, we, we don't uh, focus on candidates, but we do focus right. on issues that are important to our organization. Yes. Um, one of the questions that's been asked is what role should the atheist community have in regard to the environmental crisis that we're having? What's your opinion on that? So a couple things on that. One is this is the only planet we have. We have to take care of that because there's no afterlife waiting for us. So you can't let it burn to the ground here because who cares? We have an afterlife waiting for you. Um, and if you care about science education, listen to the scientists because they're all saying this is an environmental issue. We need to take care of these, whether it's climate change or, or fracking or whatever the issue is. Um, I feel like the politicians who have the power don't listen to the scientists who know what they're talking about, whether it's the pandemic or anything. We're in a pandemic. Let's listen to the scientists. But here's the other side. It's, and this is the same reason I would argue atheists as a whole or the nuns as a whole should be interested in LGBTQ rights or uh, women's rights or whatever it is, which is that the opposition to a lot of that is steeped in religion and it's steeped in religious language. So like why for a long time, how come same-sex marriage wasn't allowed? It's because there was a religious opposition to it. So even though atheism doesn't automatically mean you support that stuff, the opposition says religion saying they shouldn't have rights. We as atheists, we as people who care about these issues, whether it's the environment or whatever, we need to be voices on the side of facts and reason and humanity. Um, so, I mean, you can go for it, from, uh, you can go at those issues from either direction, but they still point to the same place, which is if you care about science and facts and all that stuff, why are we letting the religious right kind of pull the conversation in their direction? Because they don't necessarily care what happens to this planet because their whole theology is about what's going to happen in the next life. Yeah, it's... Uh... Anyway, yes. And yes. by the way, I should also point out there are <laughs> conservative Christians who will easily make the same argument saying, God gave us this planet, we got to take care of it. Um, I just think they're outnumbered. And that's I've, I've actually listened to some podcasts, some uh, through NPR talking about that, where they're, they're at odds within the Christian community about do we protect the environment and focus on that? Or do we say that it's going to get better in the next life? And yeah. it's interesting that they push out the environmentalists, that which is what was coming out of this study that I read. Yeah. Um, I, I see another question, which is what will be the impact of this virus on the atheist movement, in your opinion? Huh. Like, 
the, the pandemic, the, the, the sheltering in place, the isolation, and our new reality, you know, are we going to go back to public spaces anytime soon? I, I personally that's think That's an not. interesting, yeah, and that's going to hurt churches more than it hurts anybody else. I'm really curious, this is totally a hypothesis, it's not based in anything, but I think a lot of us sometimes think about all those people who go to church because they feel a pressure to go to church, because their group, their, their circle of friends go to church, they don't really care about the dogma. They go to church for other reasons. They're nominal Christians, the one who go for Easter and Christmas and stuff like that. Well, all of a sudden you can't go in person to church anymore. And what's going to happen if this, the longer this goes on, the more they get used to a life where church isn't a daily part of their life or a weekly part of their life. I wonder how many of those, the, the not super religious people just decide at the end of the pandemic, like, you know what? I'm fine without that in my life. I still want community. I still want to hang out with people, but I don't need to do it in a church setting. And I think that hurts religious groups a lot more than it hurts us because they outnumber us in terms of communities. That's true. Um, so that's that's one thing. I also think the pandemic more than pretty much anything else shows how important it is to listen to scientists and listen to uh, who are our heroes in society. It's There's people who predicted this happening months and months ago who didn't get listened to. There are people now working on a vaccine or talking about how we, medical professionals who are on the front lines, like if we take those people more seriously and they get more respect, I mean, that's a shift toward a society that values science and reason and evidence more so than a group of people that are apathetic to all that. So, I mean, I'm not saying the pandemic is good for atheism, but I do think the way we are reacting to the pandemic seems to hurt religion a lot more. And plus, look at all those uh, pastors, it's not the majority or anything, but like all those pastors in the news saying like, no, we're going to defy whatever lockdown order there is. And we're going to hold in-person church services. But aren't those outliers really? I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to I'm going to stand up for the other churches sure. here and say that that is an outlier. Cause I know some churches have come out and said, don't of do course. it. Of course. Yeah. I, I think Christianity today, evangelical publication, uh, they were making that same point. They were saying like, look, 90 to 95 percent of churches are totally fine with the lockdown order they are not saying they're doing all the right things right but there's like thirty thousand plus churches or i'm sorry i think it's more than that five percent or ten percent of churches that say we should still meet in person we're still talking oh, about oh really a lot. i didn't realize yeah. the number was that mu that much wow. yeah if it's 90 percent like people saying yes to the lockdown that's the right thing to do Yes, good for you. I'm glad most pastors are good with following the science on this. But again, like 1% of Christians who say, no, we're moving forward with in-person services. That's a lot of people. You're right. Like the, there are people like a pastor in Florida, a pastor in Mississippi, whatever, in Louisiana. Yes, there are a couple of people who are like just stupidly gung-ho about we're going to have hundreds of people in person at our services. Yes, they are on the fringe. But the number of pastors fighting to have like a dozen people in the right. same building, that is a lot. And that's a lot of people. Uh, that's you're, not you're, a fringe. You're, you're right. You're right. Um, there, there's a question here. The success of the evangelical churches hinges largely on the array of social services they offer to their adherents. Should we emulate this? Yes. They are so good at that. I'm not saying that sarcastically or anything, but I, I have said this to atheist groups before. If you are looking for a place to volunteer, a place to find a close-knit group of people, a place to help you if you lose your job or you get sick. Like the churches that are, are larger generally, but like they're so good at covering for all of that stuff. Like you get sick, there's a dozen people who will stop by your house and bring you soup. Um, that community is awesome. And that's why it's silly for atheists who are like, if I just give you this logical reason the Bible is silly, you will leave church and you'll become <laughs> like, no, no one, there's plenty of people who are not going to church because of the logic thing. They're going because of that, the social services. Um, so I would love to see more atheist communities emulate that. We don't have the numbers. We don't always have the, the, the it's hard to get the organization going. It, I mean, it, yes, it, it takes, is. 
you need more than one person. A bunch of people have to be there to organize these events. Totally. You are absolutely right. And that's why, yeah, much respect to, to groups like yours, groups like uh, those that are out there that really try and have people in charge who are just getting people involved. But yeah, I mean, we need to, because if we don't offer that to people, you are giving them more incentive to remain in church, even when they don't believe in that stuff. Right. And again, if your goal is to get them to leave, that's an important ingredient. Well, should, should that be a goal? For, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm just saying, I mean, what I, 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 yeah. on one hand I say yes, but I, you know, you don't mean on the other hand, I, I yeah. Depends what you're, what you're trying to do. I mean, if the goal is, I want you to stop believing in God, which I feel like I see online all the time. Mm -hmm. If that's the end all be all of it, then once you've read the right book or once you've been convinced of the argument, we have nothing to talk about anymore. You still got a life to live though. So, I mean, if our goal is let's create a society that isn't based on religion. That's what I think we should be. Then, doing. I mean, I, and I feel like for most of us who have been atheists for a while, um, like, again, I spend zero of my time these days trying to be convinced why I should be an atheist. Like, I'm convinced we're good. I don't need that argument anymore. I don't listen to a lot of debates on that stuff because it doesn't do anything for me or read well, books about it. It doesn't do anything actually, for me. Yeah. I, I was getting ready for today and I noticed yeah. that there, there's some YouTubers out there who spend a lot of time talking about you. Um, there's been a recent video that <laughs> popped up. very boring videos. Three, no, they, they actually made it a four part video. They, they, I forget years ago, you, you did, uh, the top 75 reasons <laughs> yeah. to, or something questions to ask or something like that. Yeah. And they were breaking them down and answering yeah. the, the video you're talking about was for the atheist voice. It was just like 73 something questions that Christians, uh, that I want Christians to answer or something like that. One of them, my favorite one was is Anne Frank, the, the Jewish girl from World War II. Is she burning in hell right now? Because right. if you're a Christian who believes you need to accept Christ or else, well, she was Jewish, but no one would say she was a bad person. So how do you answer that? It was a bunch of questions like that. And yeah, there have been a ton of response videos from Christians. Well, these were, this just happened two weeks ago. So my yeah, question is- They're still you do, doing it. <laughs> yes, they're still doing it. And do they tell you when they're doing it? Apparently Sometimes. not. Sometimes, Sometimes they do. They'll send do you, me a little message. I, I watch them. I, does it I, ever help your 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 view counts in general? Like, do you get a bump? Uh, because I I I was thinking, wow, if if I'm a uh, someone watching their video and I'm in their camp, I may be yeah. curious about you and therefore end up over on your YouTube page. Like, is there cross pollination? I don't know about that part of it. Is just YouTube's thing. Like, they don't automatically tell you like, oh, you're watching the response video. Here's the original. It's kind of on the creators to provide the original. But they use um, your name. <laughs> yeah, they do. Doesn't mean, <laughs> I mean, doesn't mean people are going to watch. So no, I don't feel, uh -huh. I don't, I don't know of any bump, but sometimes those creators do reach out and say, I made a video responding to it. And I always write back. I say, I appreciate you engaging with the questions. Um, but usually as is the case for any atheist who's been doing this for a while, like I kind of already know what I what their answers are going to be, and they've I, never surprised me. <laughs> I watched a little bit. I I wasn't going to watch an hour of them discussing it. I'll be yeah, honest. Um, yeah. They they were discussing the virgin birth and the, the questions related to that. Yeah. And and yeah. So yes, it was exactly what you would expect them to say. Um, yeah. But I like that people are talking about it. Like this is what I appreciate because there are younger people, mo more younger people, who I think have not thought about this stuff. And I think it is important for them, whether you're atheist or Christian, to say, oh, I haven't considered that before. I should have a good answer to that. And if you're getting it from a Christian you trust on YouTube, fine. But at least you're thinking about that question and you're hearing those. Like, again, I, I feel like I dislike apathy more than I dislike Christians who are genuinely engaging with this stuff. And so I appreciate when people are stepping up and doing stuff. My my daughter says hello. Hey, we get it. We we get yes. a special guest today. <laughs> but yeah, so I I like it when those people respond on those videos and stuff like that. Well, cool. Like All that. right. <laughs> Hi. She's wearing a very nice fascinator yeah. there on her head. Yeah, they like your bow on your head. <laughs> uh, Okay, so uh, one of the questions that came up was a question um, somebody asked me online when I said yes. I was going to be talking to you. 
uh, which is, are you ever nervous about, about what you're doing and the response you might get from alt-right types? Are you ever concerned about that at all? I'm not. Part of it is because I've been doing this forever on the blog. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of know what the reactions types are going to be. So if anyone says anything weird or I get nasty messages, like it's not surprising right. anymore. Right. Um, so that's part of it. Like I kind of know what to expect from being a public person online. So it's not a nervousness. Um, it, I d dislike it as with anyone when someone uh, isn't arguing about a thing that I argued. Like they've created their own thing to respond to, which is something I never said or thought I was saying. Like, I, I know this is a common statement online, but like, I wish you were all engaging me on the thing I was actually trying to say instead of what you think I said, you know? Right, right, um, right. So I, I usually don't personally respond to a lot of the bad faith arguments. I will okay. try to respond to people if I think they're genuinely uh, saying I'm wrong about something or they're making a good faith effort to, to challenge me on something. I'll, I'll try to respond to those. Okay. Um, when considering you, you have a site, um, the, the Friendly Atheist site, um, and you have so many posts every day. Uh, so my question is, how many hours a day do you spend working on that? Uh, that, that that's my first question. We'll start there. Um, it is pretty much the main thing I do every day. I'm, I'm fortunate that I can work from home. And so this is what I'm doing. Most of my nights are writing posts that I could post the next day. And most of the day is dealing with breaking news or, you know, uh, responding to things that are happening in the moment. Um, but yeah, that's why there's a lot of articles. There are a couple other writers as well who contribute things. I was going to um, ask about that. How do you yeah. vet them? How do you choose them? What's they the are, process? They are people that were writing things online that I'm like, I like what that person is saying. And I would, when we found some of them that way, um, there are some people who uh, uh, were commenters on my site uh, who I'm like, I, every time they comment, it's always something interesting and engaging. So I should like, I should talk to them about that. They've been around for a while, the ones who are writing for me now, so I'm not even sure how I found all of them. But a lot of the stuff we do is, here's a story. I know this person might be really eager to respond to it, so I'll kind of send it along their way. And there's a little bit of editing that goes on, and then it's up there. Are you ever able to take a day off? I have not taken a day off, and I can't remember the last time I took a day off. And, and wow. when I say day off, I mean where nothing went up. There are days when I knew I was going to be busy in advance, but I can write content, evergreen content that might be interesting like two or three days from now. Right. That's not dependent on the news. And I can like, so like when I had a wedding, it's like, all right, I'll get some stuff prepared because I know I'm going to be a little busy for a couple of days and make sure it goes up there. But uh, I'm probably a very bad person to take on vacation. So so how do you keep yourself, and then we'll get back to more serious questions. How yeah. do you keep yourself really energized when you're writing? I, I, it looks like, what, four or five articles a day? Yeah, based on- on the low end. Um, yeah, all right. Well, no, I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to, over a course of a year. Sure. No, it's, <laughs> it's, I'm genuinely passionate about these issues. Um, and I have the luxury of writing about the things I want to write about. So it's like, oh, this thing that someone did is something that I feel like I got to share it and I have, and I can do more than just retweeting somebody or um, sharing a post somewhere. I can actually respond to it. And this is how my response is. And I'm hoping someone reading that might say like, oh, I didn't think about this issue at all. But now that I've seen your response, that's the way I think about it too. And knowing over the course of a long time of doing this, like, oh, that does have an effect. Like that does help shape some people's views on these issues that I care about. That, I mean, it's hard to say no to that. So like, I don't really get bored doing you don't, it or anything. You don't, you don't get burned out. You, you don't reach a point where you're like, I'm, I'm ready to think about is, is a taco a sandwich yeah, or, or right. you know, th now, things like that. With other projects, this is why like, I think spending a year or two for me, like writing a book about something that might not work for me because I feel like after a month or two, I might get fizzled out. Um, right. But the blog is always changing depending on what's in the news. The reactions change depending on what's in there. And any other projects I do, like YouTube or uh, that church state separation podcast you mentioned, those were like 
projects that lasted a month or two, or maybe a little longer, give or take, where it's like, I can focus on that for a little while when I am done with the blog stuff, focus on that. And I'm interested enough. I'm not losing my own attention span on that and put it out there. And then I just move on to the next thing, you know? Do you have um, a new project coming up? I'm So the first season that you mentioned, the Pledge of Allegiance podcast, I spent maybe three or four months digging into the history of that because I know what I thought the history of it was based on my own activism and blog posts like, oh yeah, they inserted under God in the 1950s. And I know there's been a couple lawsuits over it. I did not know the full history of the Pledge of Allegiance. So that was an interesting thing to get into. And it ended up being like this four episode but long episodes of like, here's just the history. It I was, found it interesting. Maybe it was really know, great. Um, I'm trying to do that now with the Bible in school cases, um, the Madeline Murray O'Hare, right. those stories. But I know a little, I know certain parts of that because I've just been writing about this stuff for a while, but I'm getting into the nitty gritty details of all that. I don't know how long it'll take. It's kind of one of those, there's no deadline. I'll work on it when I can work on it. And when I'm done, I'll let you know. Um, YouTube has been good for little spurts where it's like, oh, I, I have like a hour or something. I can write a script for this because this I want to talk about. And then go done. Don't think about it. Well, sounds like you're you're living the dream, actually. I'm not complaining. It's it's all it's good. <laughs> I've been lucky that uh, Pathios has made it like doable. They take care of all the tech stuff, and that, they just let me focus on writing the stuff that's important to me. That's great. Have yeah. you ever had any legal issues regarding your 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 blogs? Like, have people come back or groups come back and said, "You were wrong. You did this wrong. We want to take you to court. We want to fight with you about this." I'm trying to think. Like, I've gotten a couple of those letters, but they're usually, I mean, anyone can look at them, and it's like I didn't say anything about you. I, I mean, I'm also better at knowing what to post. I'm not. I'm not out there trying to make slanderous arguments against groups. Usually most of the stuff I post is here's their video. <laughs> like here's the thing they said, I'm just gonna show it to you. Or here's the line that they said. Like, I don't have to take them out of context. I don't have to make them look bad. They make themselves look bad. I'm just, <laughs> you, here's what it is. Um, one, I'll give you one example of a time. Like um, we posted, there was a Christian right activist who posted on her website years ago basically an argument in favor of hitting your children um, because that's the way to discipline them. Wow. And on my site, we, we had screenshots, we quoted from it and they wrote back and they're like, well, that's not her site anymore. She doesn't say that or anything. And she's wrong. Like, no, that was her website. It went up on her website. And I wrote back to the lawyer. I'm like, look, if her views have changed or, uh, or I quoted her out of context, because all we said is this appeared on her website. Not that she wrote it because her name wasn't on a byline, but it's like, if, if we're wrong, you tell me. I'm happy to go back and say, hey, she doesn't believe this anymore. Isn't that wonderful? I'm like, you give me a statement. I will put it as an update at the top of that post. So if anyone sees the original, they'll see the update. I'll write a new one, whatever you want. And then they never write back because of course they believe that stuff. Um, I think one or two times they've been like, uh, you posted this thing. Um, I'm trying to think of what. There was one case where someone said, there's a story that's out there about me, but the source you're getting it from isn't trustworthy. And I don't like the person I'm talking to, but I listen to what they said. And looking back, I'm like, you know what? I think he's right. That source isn't trustworthy, even if it makes him look bad, which I right. thought it did. Um, right, right. So you know what? I'll we removed that post when it was necessary. So, I mean, I've never had any serious legal issues, but also I'm not out there trying to do anything that would provoke that sort of reaction. You're you friendly. Know? You're you're friendly, and, I, and so maybe I don't even <laughs> think that I don't even think that's the issue. It's that like uh, for a lot of the people I write about, I don't have to make things up about them. So I don't know why there would be a legal issue. It's honestly like you like. Jocelyn, you made a video where you said X, Y, Z, and all I'm doing is like, well, here's the YouTube video she posted, and here's my thoughts about it. Right. That's totally they, permissible, you know? They make themselves look bad. Yeah. 
And I found that to be a thing with like just liberal, whether it's liberal comedians, political daily show type of people or activists, whether it's an LGBTQ activist or an atheist activist or whatever, a lot of the stuff we do is saying, this is what the other side said. We're just putting it here for you so you could see it. And maybe here's our commentary on it afterwards. Whereas on the flip side, what I have found when I look at like Christian websites, especially conservative Christian websites, this just happened yesterday. They were saying, you know, the mayor of this town is trying to, uh, what was it? They're, they want every church to tell the names and addresses. They want all the contact information of who goes to church because they want to know who you are and track you. Wow. What was interesting about that is if you go to the mayor's website, they didn't say anything like that. They basically said, look, if you, we're going to open churches up just like we're opening up a bunch of places. But if you are going to have a lot of people there, we need to know where, if COVID is spreading, we need to know how to contact everyone there and say, hey, there was someone in your midst who had that. You right. may want to get tested. And they're saying, hey, churches, you need to keep a list in case that happens so that we can reach out to you and say, hey, this person told us they went to your church. You need to reach out to these people. That is a very different thing. But what I found interesting is the Christian right group that said they're coming after you. They want to track you. They didn't link back to the original. They didn't post wow. the original thing the mayor said, because I don't think they trust their readers enough to say like, oh, well, let us see the original. And we'll, they never do that. They no. always take them out of context. They distort what was actually said. Whereas I think the people, I think on our side of these issues are like, here's the thing, go watch it for yourself. <laughs> like we're not taking it out of context. Well, yeah, I, I think most of the people that I talk to, if they don't see a reference list at the end, they're like, I don't, I'm not gonna take your word for it even if I agree with it. You better give exactly. me the references. I, I mean, I've gotten pretty uh, good because I've gotten that backlash once or twice way in the past where it's like, I don't want your word for it. You tell me where I can read it for myself. So I'll do both. It's like, here is my commentary, but here's the original report. I kind of get really upset. This is a pet peeve of my own just blogging. Anytime I see a newspaper article about a lawsuit and very few of them ever link to the actual lawsuit or the ruling. Oh, wow. And part of that is because uh, you don't want to include links in a story that may be passed around. But also it's always frustrating when it's like the judge said this. And I'm like, let me see the judge's ruling. I want to see how they wrote it. And it's not there. And I got to go dig it up myself. Oh. But I try to include that in my posts. If I write about a lawsuit, here's the original complaint. Here's what the judge said. You can read it for yourself if you don't trust me on my excerpts or whatever I'm saying about it. Right. Yeah, you do a great job of that. And we, we're kind of winding down. And one sure. of the, the hot button topics that we had to talk about was your experience on Jeopardy. <laughs> and and how it was for you and and obviously you like vocabulary but what did it take yeah. for you to get ready for that i know you've talked about it but inquiring sure. minds want to know um so i found out i would i auditioned for the show like anyone auditions for the show i found out i was gonna be on i think mid-december and they said your taping is at the end of january so i had about six weeks um, so I reached out to a couple people I knew who had been on the show saying, what would you suggest I study? I mean, I looked on You Reddit. know people who've been on the show. I know a couple people who've been on. <laughs> one who's been successful on the show and a, and a few people who've been on and lost. But they all said the same thing, which is um, they gave me a, this was not news to me, but they're like, there's a few basic things you better study up on. World capitals. Not because they're going to say, what's the capital of Madagascar or something, but because those might be clues they might reference that stuff and so if you know Shakespeare place if you know world capitals if you know a Greek mythology that's probably the best setup for success you might have um so I I tried and so that was part of it I tried to kind of re-educate myself on that stuff that I haven't studied in a really so, long so, time. So, I mean, seriously speaking, how, how much time did you actually you, you interview and then did they told you you're getting on? Um, I took an online test. This was probably January of last year. Okay. Um, everyone can take the online test. I think it's any time now. Um, I got an email like that summer saying, hey, whatever your score was, we want you to come for an in-person audition, which I had never gotten before. Um, so <laughs> the in-person audition, I uh, long story, but I had to go to Milwaukee for it. There were like 50 of us in the room, in a hotel ballroom 
And basically they said, one, you're gonna take another 50 question test. It goes by fast, just answer the question. So we know you didn't cheat online. Right, basically. of course, yeah. Um, and make sure you do know, you have a broad base of knowledge. They let us play a mock game of Jeopardy with buzzers, like, uh, <laughs> and also they, and the reason for that, they even said this to us, I don't think anyone believed them. It's, we don't care if you get the question right, we just want to see how you look. Do you look comfortable or are you the just meh, meh? And then if you get something wrong, you freak out. Like that would not be a good contestant. It might be um, entertaining though. Yeah, it might be for, for like a second and then you feel <laughs> no. bad. Um, so they wanted to watch how you look and how you talk if they ask you some bantery type questions. And that was it. And they said to all of us like, uh, thanks for coming. We may call you anytime between now and a year and a half from now. Or maybe never, probably never. Um, but if we want you, we'll call you anytime between now and then. Um, and if you don't hear from us, we hope you audition again. And that's what they told all of us. Um, and I was shocked that I got a phone call that said, nope, you're gonna be on. It's gonna be this date. And if you have something going on, too bad. <laughs> like, did you either. have to pay to get there? I did. Or they basically say, uh, your taping date is this <laughs> date. And they yeah. said, you pay for your flight, you pay for your hotel. They gave some recommendations, but you pay for your hotel. Um, but when you lose, because everyone's going to lose, um, I, there's a $1,000 consolation prize for third place. So basically, it kind of offsets yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. you put in. Um, and if you win, you win. Great. Uh, so that was, but yeah, so in addition to studying the basic world capitals type of stuff, there's an archive online with every game in the past like yeah. for the past 20 some years, every question, I would just play that in my own head, just going through the categories. Cause you do see some stuff pop up again and again. Um, for example, alcoholic drinks, which I know nothing about, but they kind of ask about the same drinks. So if you know, like, oh, that's a type of martini that they seem to ask questions about, or um, this reference to this ancient Greek person that they seem to like, oh, maybe that's a thing to study up on so I just kind of went back in time and played as many of those games as possible when I wasn't blogging. Just going through brain break, take up some of those. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a, wow, that's kind of exciting. And, it was, and you know what was really fun? I kind of, I've been out of school for so long. I haven't studied in a long time and it was kind of a, a pleasant treat to study for something I genuinely wanted to do. And I don't remember the last time I did that, you know? Right, right, right. Um, um, how how did you um, do for those who didn't watch? Sure. So you, um, you um, can you give a quick? Yeah, uh, the recap is I ended up winning one game. Um, I got lucky in how I won, but I ended up winning one game. Uh, I came back for a second game, which was in real time, about five minutes later. Um, and in the second game, I could have won, but I lost. I didn't know the final Jeopardy. And I got uh, beaten by someone who had an awesome game. Um, but I, I can say I'm a Jeopardy champion. So I will carry that with me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was, what, like $14,000 or something. Yeah, right? I mean, it, it was, was, it was uh, it's impressive to me. I mean, it was cool. Yeah, uh, it will. It's not like some life changing amount of money, but it was one of those like I that was such a cool experience and it worked out better than I could have anticipated because I know myself, I'm not the type of person who's going to have a 50 game winning streak and win a gazillion dollars. I'm just like, just give me a chance to maybe win one game. And that's exactly how it went down. So I was very happy. Well, uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> it, it was uh, exciting to see you on, on I, I saw it on Facebook. Suddenly it's like, whoa, Hemet's a winner. And I was all excited <laughs> and I'm like, ah, I've I'm met fine. him and, and he's actually won this. So it's, it's really exciting. You know, what was really neat about it. There were 11 or 12 of us at the taping, like I think 11 of us were actually going to end up playing in the week of shows we taped. So for the first three, four hours of your day, it's just orientation. It's getting to know each other. It's getting to uh, practice on in the studio before. Mm -hmm. And none of us know who we're going to be up against. None of us know which day of the week we're going to be taping. So it, we, we all just got to know each other and like everyone there. I mean, they're obviously smart, but everyone was so different. And it's such a cool and unique experience to like, here's a bunch of people you've never met. You're about to be bonded in the weirdest sort of way. <laughs> Are you still friends? Uh, with Like, have you stayed in touch with any of them? Yeah, with actually uh, 
two of the competitors I actually played with, uh, one I beat, one who beat me, I, we've still talked several times since the shows were taped and after they aired. So yeah, like it was neat. There's there's Facebook groups for people who Did they know the you were an atheist? I mean, that, that was part think, of your- that nope. Your, nope, it wasn't actually a part of anything I told them I did. I told them I was a blogger, but okay. I didn't tell them. I said, I blog and they, about politics they didn't and Google religion. Google you or anything, I guess. I don't think they care, even if they did, uh, to be huh. honest with you. But they were just like, oh, you're a blogger. Okay, that's all we need to know. Um, I don't think any, it, the, the topic did not come up dur at right. any point. Um, they cool. they uh, asked about, yeah, I think that was it. I think a that's very all secular I experience. Yeah, it really was. And everyone was so interesting because they're all coming from these different walks of life. And I mean, I competed against like an opera singer, a screenwriter, a uh, maybe a social worker. Uh, they were just so interesting all over the place. That's that's so cool. Yeah. All right. Well, we've kind of reached the end of our time. I do want you to share with everyone who's watching this where they can find you online or on social media. So sure. So the share easiest that. way to find me is friendlyatheist.com. Uh, if you're on YouTube, just search for Friendly Atheist. You'll find that page. And uh, if podcast is your thing, friendlyatheistpodcast.com. But uh, Google it. You'll find it. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate having you here today. It's uh, been great to have this thank you. casual conversation. Absolutely. Uh, I hope I can come back there in person in the near future. Uh, me too. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the CFFC, it's been great to have you here. And I thank you for all of that. We appreciate uh, having you here. I'm going to now talk about a few upcoming events. Uh, two weeks from today on May 17th, Again, at 3 p.m., we will have with us a special guest, Representative Anna Escamani of the Florida House District 47. We've asked her to give us a legislative update for the 2020 session, so we look forward to that. Uh, two weeks after that, on May 31st, we're gonna be joined on Zoom by Dave Warnock, who was supposed to join us back in March before everything changed. As you may know, uh, Dave is a former Christian clergyman who is no longer a believer. He was diagnosed with ALS, a terminal illness, so he has dedicated the rest of his life to dying out loud, and his new motto is carpe the effing diem. And while we would love to see him here in the near future, uh, he's agreed to do an online event with us. So be sure to join us for both of those special events. Um, as a reminder, we're continuing our meetup events, including Free Thought Cafes, Secular Women events, which are Zoom meetings. Uh, to find out how to join us there, you need to sign up on meetup at meetup.com slash CFL Free Thought. Uh, and until next time, no matter what your governor or president says, keep your hands clean. And we look forward to seeing you. Thank you.